what triggers reveal our insecurities? The guilt is greater when a man is cheating on a woman. So what is a high value woman? There's men out there that accept the unacceptable when it comes to women. If you're a girl who wants a six foot two in shape man, but none of those men are giving you attention, change your type. I know guys, I will spend two, three thousand pounds on a table, but their mum hasn't got a car. I would give a lot of the credit for why marriages are breaking down to pornography. Children need two parents. And when they don't have that, they don't regulate their emotions correctly. I always find men who grew up with just their mum and no access to their father and no access to the dad's side of the story are more likely to be cheated on. The skills that you need for business are not transferable for relationships. Rich men get cheated on more. Rich men get cheated on more. This is the topic. Treat your body like a home for your brain. What are some of the red flags then that both men and women can look out for in the opposite sex? Make decisions today that you won't regret in 10 years. Quick one before we jump into this podcast. Do me a solid favour. Hit that like button. Hit subscribe and drop a comment below this video. If you're looking to remove images, videos, search results or fake accounts online, go to contentremoval.com. But don't take my word for it. Here's some music. Frank, you're a legend. I just saw this. Layla also thinks you're a legend, which in my mind means you're... <laughs> Which also, which means you're a double legend in my mind. If you get my wife to think you're a legend, then you're you're extra cool in my mind, dude. Thank you so much, genuinely. That was um, such a pain. Welcome back to the podcast and have I got a treat for you today. It's not often we get to sit down with one of the best psychologists in the game, Salia Khan. Welcome to the podcast. That's a bit of pressure actually, uh, but I'll take it. Best uh, psychologist in the game. It, it, well, Relax. Well, the, 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 view, the, views, the views that you get say that you are. So, okay, I'll you know, take that then. You're the, most, you're the most viewed psychologist at the moment, I reckon, maybe on social media. Maybe at the media. moment. Yeah, maybe at the moment, I guess. Yeah. I, thi- I think before we go into the, uh, the, the deep stuff around... Well, all the topics that we're going to go into, we're going to go into some mad topics, I'm sure we are. But before going into that, I just want to kind of get an understanding of why you wanted to even become a psychologist in the first place and what interests you about the human mind and how it works. Um, You know, that's actually a great question. Thank you for asking that. But I was always a very inquisitive child. I always wanted to know why people do that. Like it wasn't enough because I had very strict parents incredibly strict parents so wasn't allowed to do this wasn't allowed to do that and I was always curious why because I never really got the why you know parents they're just strict so I was always wondering why 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 and because I had that curiosity I um, then started studying psychology in school I was young I was only like 15 16 years old and um, my teacher was just very encouraging she was just like you're really good at this this is very natural for you you need to take this further and me being a kid I was like I'm I'm not going to do much with it what am I going to do so I started studying psychology in university did my degree master's everything and I got sick of it and I was like, I'm not doing that again but then I realized how much I, mi- I like working with children so I decided to become a psychology teacher for a couple of years uh, because I just love kids yeah they're so funny they're so vibrant I really recommend everybody to work it's with pure kids. energy isn't it you know what? They're so alive. You know when I used to walk around in the in the lunch hall and the kids would be smiling, laughing, dancing. Then you go in the staff room and it's miserable and cold. And I just thought, how do people work with adults all the time? You need energy and the children have it. Have you ever worked with kids? I have taught carpentry to kids when I, when I was because I've been a teacher myself like in colleges and, yeah. and done stuff in schools as well so I've taught them carpentry and, and physical stuff and do, and also work with them in boxing as well oh, like amazing. teaching teaching boxing they're fantastic they're just they're just like sponges and they're appreciative of what of what you can bring you know what I mean and they inspire you because you, what I learned from them, I think this is one of my, I think this is the core behind my success on social media. When you have children trying to learn something very complex, you have to get into the habit of simplifying it make it digestible. So you take psychology, which is really intense, and you have to make it digestible to a 50-year-old boy who's got no attention. So when I got into the habit of doing that, I realized I can dissect psychology and actually teach it to the masses in quite a digestible manner. So that's why I thought, let me just post it online because I have the skills to kind of make something very complex and uh, just make it quick and easy and accessible. So because of teaching, all praise be to God, it was all because of teaching. So because of that, I started started posting it online and it just kind of took off from there and now we're here because i because a lot of your content that i see i even if it's something i don't know i don't go getting triggered by it i just i was i'll listen to it and i'll be like oh yeah i can understand that from that perspective yeah uh, i think that's because i've probably done a little bit of work that i don't get triggered but i see so many people in your comment section Crazy, on your videos right? that if it's something said in certain a narrative because they think a different opinion they will fight not only you in the comments, but fight other people in the comments. Yeah. So why do people then, 
psychologically want to have a war on social media these days? Like, what, what, what is, what's the, the the reason behind all that? You know what I would imagine it is. It's um, where our triggers reveal our insecurities. So, and how you respond to them is how much work you've done in healing. So what I find is, say, for example, I talk about the importance of fathers in children's lives um, and how much they need a father. I'll have single moms in my comments being like, my ex was a narcissist, he was so abusive. They're so zoomed in to their perspective and their experience. They can't zoom out and think, yeah, my ex was terrible, but my child is still going to suffer. My child's psychology is not going to be totally accepting of the fact that dad was a, a terrible. It's still needs a masculine figure they can't think like that they're so holding on to their triggers and they're so defensive of it because they don't want to do the inner work so when I see like the trigger trolls um, I actually just feel a bit sorry for them because I'm like if this triggers you so much it's a message it's a signal to you to your brain of what you need to work on so use it constructively rather than using it to start a war so everything that triggers people, like anyone that's listening to this right now, anything that triggers them in their life is a button that they need to essentially remove. It's a wound. It's a wound. So, uh, what happens with psychology and psychological experiences and traumas, it creates a wound no different to a physical wound. Like if I had a, a burn on my leg and someone brushes past it, even if they didn't mean to, it's like, ah, be careful, my knee, my knee, and Psychology does the same thing. If I have a psychological wound and someone just brushes past it with no intention to offend you, simply to just get to the destination, you're going to overreact. And that's what I see the trolls is doing. They overreact and they get really... And I think what's easy with somebody like me compared to maybe other psychologists is it's very easy to attack my looks. It becomes their first thing. It's their first protocol. Is to kind of go straight for my appearance, um, and I, 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 I'm completely used to it, so I don't bother it. But it's one of those things that is actually really interesting. Whereas perhaps if a different psychologist, maybe she's seventy years old, talking about the same thing, no one would go for her appearance. But if I say the same thing, first thing happens. Yeah, but you're, you, all you do is you wear makeup. You're this. You're, I bet you're a slag. You're this. That. So I get far more personal comments with, with the triggers. So you even get the slag comments oh, just, all the because, time. just because, just because yeah. of your appearance. I remember I, I might say something like the importance of a father and so they'll start saying you're an escort, you're this, you're that. and It, uh, you're th- it will get so extreme, personal. But never about the content. It gets because here's what happens: my content is quite well explained, so they can't necessarily attack the content. So it's quicker and easier to defend yourself by attacking me. And the quickest way to attack me is to go for my appearance. So that shows a lot of vulnerabilities in the people that are attacking you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a quick and easy jab because they assume that's what I care about the most. They they I've hurt them with my words, unbeknownst to me. I've just done it by explaining something. They want to attack me back, and because you know they might see me dressed up or a bit makeup, and they think the quickest and easiest way to hurt her back is to say something about her appearance. Is an assumption a cover for a trigger that's not been healed? Absolutely. Yeah. So can you can you explain why that is the case? Well, the thing is, I would imagine if they are assuming that I'm like this and I'm a terrible person and I'm hideous, all right, what it does is then it invalidates my message to them. And then they don't have to work on what I'm talking about. So this so this happens in business, in life, in every 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 factor and every field. Everything it happens, yeah. Because here's the thing: people talk a lot about pretty privilege, and they'll say to, so stuff like, "Oh, yeah, but you you know, pretty privilege, and you've just you know that's why you're you only go you've only had this level of success because of your pretty." But it actually works massively against you. In this particular field, if I was an influencer selling makeup products, absolutely pretty privilege matters. But in an academic sense, it's been nothing but a hindrance. In schools, in uh, when I was educating everything, when I was doing my qualifications, I found uh, like if if you even take some pride in your appearance, people automatically assume you're dumb, and then you have to work double hard to kind of ass- uh, get that respect. And I found it with students as well. I'd walk into a classroom and immediately they'd be like, oh, she's going to be shit. Oh, she's... And then they'd give me that resistance and I'd have to extra prove myself to just get the normal baseline level of respect. Did that add wounds to you as a psychologist that you then had to overcome? What it did for me is it made me very self-deprecating. So anyone who knows me knows that within five minutes I'll say an insult to myself. I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. I'm so oh, I'm so fat. I'll say you stupid. did it before the podcast. Did I? What did I say? You you were uh, you was not 
not in not in the sense of uh, in the way that you've just explained, but in the sense of like when we're talking about cameras and stuff, and you yeah. you, you, you apologise and you and you're apologising for things you don't need to apologise for. Yeah, I'm overly I'm so self deprecating. I'm overly apologetic because I was constantly criticised in my field because I because I, I you know taking care of your appearance and then going into schools would automatically especially with the female students put them on guard anything I would say to them they would take it negatively because they would assume it's coming from a place of arrogance so I had to self-deprecate to get their to get their alliance I'd have to say oh I'm so ugly oh I'm so stupid oh I'm so this I'm, and only through putting myself down would I get their warmth so I got into the habit of doing that do you, you know, with friend groups and like, you know, groups of girls, groups of guys, do you see, let's, let's just say, for, let's just take, for instance, a group of girls that are mm. together. Do you find that there's a lot of crabs in a bucket mentality within these groups these days that hold the someone that wants to break out of a pattern back so to speak yeah do you know what I, I i find that especially in london i experience that what happens in london in, in dubai the sky is the limit you can literally be a ceo of a top company and you know everybody can so there's no holding each other back as much but in london there is a glass ceiling whether it's due to structural racism whether it's due to you know some uh, like where you come from your background whatever there's some glass ceiling so what happens is people really put down your efforts to overachieve or to get out of there. And I understand sometimes some people can be a bit delusional and you just want to give them a reality check. But even if it's as small as like traveling a lot, things that are so achievable, they want to put you down. But like, why don't you just save your money? Why are you always out all the time? Why do you always go for dinner? They just have to question your happiness. And it's a strange, it's a strange mentality. There's a lot of podcasters out there at the moment that are talking about masculinity mm -hmm. at scale. One, one podcast in America that I know is called Fresh and Fit. Uh -huh. And... There's these two guys on there. One of them's called Myron, I think, and they preach being high value men. Mm -hmm. And from the outside looking in, uh, on a personal level, I, I'm like, I don't find them as high value as sometimes as what they say they are. Yeah, because of the positioning with the women that they're with. Exactly. Because right? I because uh, so are these men high value from a psychological point of view? Or, yeah. or, or or what's or what's the go with that and, and why is society rewarding this? I, I feel like what's actually that culture is a bunch of men who have been extremely rejected in their past, don't have a lot of success with women and are now punishing women through the use of money. Now, now that they made a bit of money, now they can punish them and embarrass them on their platform. But the reality is here, here's this, this is what high value men truly are. Your high value is determined by the level of woman you can get to submit to you. That's your value. The highest level of woman that you can get to submit to you. Now, if the highest level of woman you can get to uh, like kind of submit and look after and be loyal to you is, an, uh, is a stripper or is like they usually get a lot of OnlyFans modelers. So that's the highest level of woman you can get to be loyal to you. You're not high value. But if you can get a woman who is up there, has plenty of options and is inaccessible, highly loyal, if you can get that woman to submit to you, that's when you're high level. So if you want to know whether you're a high value man, look at the highest level of women you can get to totally be loyal to you. And if it's low, you're not that high value. And the other thing that they do that I find really bizarre is they take low value women and kind of like speak to them badly and teach men to disrespect to their woman, like to kind of be rude to them and, and not give them too much and give them less. But the, this was what truly high value men do. They pick wisely. They pick super, super wisely. They're highly selective with the women that they choose. And then when they've chosen her correctly, they spoil her endlessly. They put her through the ringers. It's like, you know when you go to six, seven rounds of an interview to get into those corporate jobs, they make you go through interview after interview after interview, a bit like going to a Harvard application. When you get to Harvard, they treat you well. Your life is set. But up until that point, they put you through it. What Fresh and Fit teach is take any kind of woman and then don't give her too much, play games, treat her harshly. That's not what high-value men do. They've got a reputation. They can't just take any old girl and then try and tra train her. They ain't got time for that. They take a woman who's been well trained by her family. That's amazing. Like, I've never seen it from that perspective before. Like well, well trained by her family. I mean, that's your that, dad's that's job. That's going to that's going to get a lot of a lot of people's backs up, especially some. So obviously, there might be some women that listen to this that might not have had a dad. And yeah, and like the dad might not have be, been around. Mm. And I've noticed that from my own dating life that if I've dated a girl 
with who's who's come from a and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. Yeah. It's like a he's like a broken, broken home, home. Yeah. and and the dad's been absent for periods of time. The, the level of trauma that that girl's got in her yeah. life has made it more difficult and has brought up triggers within me Absolutely. from my childhood. Absolutely. So how? Does that affect a woman then, not for them not having a father? Here's the thing. What a lot of men and women do, when they have an absent father, they remove the pain of it by destroying his reputation, by saying, I hate him. He was a prick. He was this. He was that. Fine. He might be Ted Bundy. He might be the worst person on the planet. It doesn't change the fact that you needed two parents growing up. And the lack of one parent is still traumatic. So how they defend themselves is by saying they didn't need their dad. They don't care about their dad. No worries, no one's suggesting that you did, but it still causes a trauma in a child. And the trauma, you only, you only realise the trauma mostly when they try and get into relationships. And there's a level of fear of abandonment that you can't, you can't set, soothe them with. Sometimes you just can't soothe them. They just might be overly anxious that you're going to leave them. They might be overly independent and think, I don't need you because you might leave at any point. They might be uh, easily triggered. And you're thinking, I'm doing my best. What's wrong with her? Why won't she calm down? Children need two parents. And when they don't have that, they don't regulate their emotions correctly as an adult. And it's hyper-triggered when they're in a relationship and they're finally in love. That's when they behave their worst. So essentially what you're saying is... by having an absent parent, mother or father, mother or father, you create a chemical imbalance in your brain mm-hmm. that now makes you harder to date when you when you get older, unless you deal with your traumas. Unless you deal with it. So, if there's people listening to this podcast that male or female that have been through the, been through this, where a parent has been absent, mm-hmm. they believe on the surface that they've dealt with it. Yeah, they'll say, "I'm fine. I don't need him. I don't think about him." They think it's about him. They don't think it's about the impact it's had on their psychology. So how can they then do do the inside work on a psychological level so that they can attract the partner? Because I I know I know there's a I know a, one girl specifically that listens to this podcast, and she, um, there's a friend of mine, and she's she she dates the same kind of men all the time, yeah. and then then complains about these type of men on a constant cycle. Yeah. What does she? What trigger does she have to break in order to break that? It, it does depend on the type of wound the dad left. If it was just abandonment, uh, they might just and they never met him. They might go for a man a lot older, and they're seeking somebody to create that kind of father masculine figure. If they never met him, if it was somebody who uh, was abusive and then left, they'll look for somebody who is equally abusive, makes them earn their love and stuff. So it does depend on the type of trauma. But here's what I would say to start with: Do you have both sides of the story? I've had too many times where I've witnessed women brainwash children and deprive men of access to their children and brainwash that child. And that child grows up completely and utterly loyal to their mum. And with that loyalty, you have to sacrifice objectivity. In order to be completely loyal to your brainwashing mother, you have to be naive about women. And that sets them up terribly. I always find men who grew up with just their mum and no access to their father and no, no access to the dad's side of the story are more likely to be cheated on. Repeat that again. <laughs> so men, men who grew up with just their mother yeah. and had no access to the dad in any way, no, no, didn't understand the dad's side of the story, was just told that dad was terrible, they're more likely to be cheated on by their partners. Wow. And the reason being is if they had access to dad and they saw for their own eyes that dad's a bit, you know, he's a bit of a mess, it's not so bad. But when they don't even have access, mum just moved them away, just separated them, got courts involved. What happens there? What happens there is they start to put women on a pedestal. They think women don't lie. Women tell the truth. And they also don't see wife behaviour. They don't see that mum wives are supposed to, you know, come home at a certain time, check in or anything like that. They just see an independent woman. So when they meet women... They're naive. They think women don't lie. Women tell the truth. Men are bad. Yeah, that's how they see the world. And then they also don't know the protocol of what a married woman should be like, that she should check in. Whereas when you live with mum and dad, you see mum doesn't go out so much at night. And you see that mum's a bit annoying as well. Poor dad, she's a bit rude to him. You know, you see both sides of it. You see how annoying mum can be. But when you get no access to that, you become totally, totally naive about the severity of some women. So what is a high value woman? I would just say a high value woman is determined by the level of men she can say no to and resist. 
what I mean by that is if she can have really low value men and she's just saying no to them, she's not that high value. So low value men, you're saying no, it's not that deep. But if you can get top tier men who are all after you and you're still selective, you're a high value woman. By top tier, you mean? High, men that have an incredible amount of options and they're looking to not just sleep with you, to be with you and you still are selective. And why do you think that in today's society we've we've gone away from this traditional marriage, um, traditional relationships, there's now open relationships, there's all these different genders and sexes and all this mm-hmm. other stuff that's going on that I'm sure we can talk about and the psychology behind that. But what's, you know, what's, what's the go uh, with all I, that? I do think it's deliberate. I do think it's like structurally programmed. I do think it's deliberate, but I would give a lot of the credit to pornography. I would give a lot of the credit for why marriages are breaking down to pornography because it teaches men and women desires that are completely against the requirements of a marriage and monogamy. So it teaches men to enjoy a lot of threesomes, teaches women to enjoy that, it teaches abuse, it teaches degradation, it teaches like how, the import, like how important sex has to be in a marriage and if it doesn't feel like this, it's pointless. What it does is it completely um, destroys the traditional values that are required for a long-lasting, monotonous, endless marriage. So you, a, a typical marriage actually does get boring sexually, actually does require some tradition. It requires you to be a bit of a prude and this, that and the other because you have to self-regulate. You have to be in self-control. What porn does is say, indulge in every desire you could possibly have. That doesn't set you up for a lifetime of marriage. By porn being in, in any vicinity of, of a relationship, you are increasing your chance of divorce? I would say so. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't I don't think in any... Uh, uh, the thing is, there's been no research that suggests it has any positive consequences. None. What, people think, oh, but yeah, it lightens up your sex life and it lightens... But here's the thing. Having a really bright sex life isn't actually an essential ingredient for marriage. An active sex life, a continuous, dedicated sex life is. When you brighten up your sex life, it then becomes difficult to accept monotonous and accept you know, stable sex. So brightening it up doesn't actually create long-lasting sex within a marriage. So if you are a, a man listening to this and you want your, your goal at the moment, you're between 20 and 35, for argument's sake, and you want to smash business and smash life and, and, and really send it so that in your 40s you're set up and you're well and, mm-hmm. you're, do, and you're doing the things that you, and you want to move different in, in that time zone, what would you be saying? Should they be looking for a partner partner now or should they should they just be in the relentless pursuit of their goals and then the partner will align at the right time um it's a bit it's very tricky for men because here's the thing the reality is having a woman really does tick that box off so the distraction of women calms down slowly. When you're totally single, every weekend you have to think, what table are we getting? Uh, where, what holiday are we going on? You have to think about these things, like how are we getting girls? Because, you know, you don't want to go out and this, that and the other without a girl. Um, and when you have someone, that box is kind of ticked off. So that distraction is off. But at the same time, you also need to dedicate yourself to your, uh, to your goals. So it's very difficult to manage both. And sometimes what can happen is when a man meets a woman when he's not quite where he should be and then he kind of, his career flourishes, they're no longer compatible because he's become really, really dedicated and hardworking and she may not have because she was just supporting him. They're now intellectually less intimate. So it's very difficult for men. I would say I would say it's very difficult to choose. But what I would say is not so much whether you have a partner or whether you don't have a partner. It's more whether you have discipline or don't have discipline with women. Do you have discipline with women? If it is a case I don't have time for a partner, I'm only going to have casual relationships, but I'm not going to go spending the thousands on a table, going to be really thirsty when I get into a club, think I need it. Discipline with that. If I have it, I have it. If I don't, I don't. I've got to focus. But if you don't have discipline, whether you're in a relationship, outside a relationship, you're not going to reach your goals because it will trickle over into your financial success. If you've got really messy women around you or if you uh, are not disciplined with who you're sleeping with, what you're doing, you can end up having a child. Anything can throw you off. So discipline is the key thing. So when you say discipline in relation, because you say discipline and you say casual in the same, yeah. the same essence. So you say... You're in the pursuit of this massive goal, whatever the goal is for you, business, whatever it is. You might have an e-com brand. You might, whatever, whatever, whatever you're doing. You might be playing sport, whatever. You're a man, right? You're in the pursuit. You're saying discipline casual. What, what, 
I want. I really want to go into what disciplined casual actually is. To I, you. I'm not a fan or an encourager of anything casual. But what I would say is, some men they engage in what they think is casual relationships with women they think are low value, and it's just a bit of. The, it's only a matter of time before they get attached. They pretend they don't. But there's so many men I know that was like, oh, you know, she she was a hoe, but I fell in love with her. You know, or she was a hoe, I didn't take her serious, so I was so able to be myself because I didn't take her serious. Now we're in love and we're having a baby. Or, or you know, I don't respect her, don't really want anything to do with her, but now she's pregnant. So there's no discipline. If you're going to be casual, at least be very disciplined with it, as in even your casual partners. There's a criteria, there's a, le- there's a threshold of if worst case scenario, if anything did happen, I'd be okay with us being together. Even if I can't dedicate the time and energy into creating something now. But when men completely drop their standards with casual relationships, they find themselves in situations they can't handle. What should women do then if they're caught in this casual casual sex trap, the not not truly valuing themselves? Yeah. What what should they be doing and how should they be moving diff- to move different? Ask yourself the question, is being with him going to make me feel ashamed of myself or proud of myself? And if the answer is, I leave feeling a bit ashamed of myself, don't do it. Do you think some women are addicted to feeling the same shame over and over again? They're not addicted to the shame. They're addicted to the momentary feeling of comfort that he might give, the ego boost he might give, the sense of comfort he might give in those 10, 20 minutes. And then the shame they forget about because they just want to numb the pain of feeling like low and getting his attention again makes her feel high and loved. And so they, they forget, but the shame sinks in straight after. And they think the cure to the shame is to get back with him again. Every time he calls her, she feels loved again. She thinks, okay, let me get rid of the shame. I don't feel as bar- embarrassed that he's calling me again. But the real way to get rid of the shame is to exit. Do you think then women misunderstand what high value truly is? I think uh, the social media misunderstands what high value is. Social media uh, um, measures high value by just having money. But truly high value is um, ensuring that you give, not only do you have a lifestyle that is high value, but you also create an emotional connection that is high value. You create a sense of safety, loyalty and trust that's also high value, hard to achieve. But if it's just like, oh, he's really rich, but she's cheating, he's cheating, it's a messy environment, what's high value about that? Who envies that? So these people then that are in these open relationships, are the, essentially what you're saying then is they're just, they're just in those relationships, not because they're truly, in essence, happy with it, mm. but they're just dealing with wounds that they don't even know they're dealing with. They're, they're pleasure-seeking. What's happening is there's some level of internal turmoil and they're thinking pleasure-seeking is going to get rid of that sadness, it's going to get rid of that emptiness, it's going to get rid of that shame. But pleasure-seeking is the opposite of happiness. True happiness comes from stable, healthy peace. So what about all these girls then that do like things like OnlyFans and stuff like that, that are are going around, they're making 100k a month, Mm -hmm. they're calling themselves girl bosses, all this kind of stuff like that mm-hmm. on a psychological level wh- are, 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 are they that or you know are they the girl boss uh, are, or, or is that is that a false economy that they've bought into being sold a narrative by social media i don't believe any human being can um reveal and allow others to access the most sacred part of them without feeling some shame i'm sure the money helps I'm sure the money helps, but there's an element of shame and guilt every time you I do that, and then afterwards you have to think, God, this dirty old man, oh, I wish I didn't have to kiss him, but I'll just do it anyway. And so when that you have that extreme level of shame and guilt, the only way to feel good about it is to pretend you're in control of it and to take control. And how you take control? By, by boasting about it pretending it's great it's a bit like people who are super super overweight and they say i'm i'm fabulous i'm big boned yeah i'm fabulous i'm beautiful i'm just no you're unhealthy you struggle when you go up and down the stairs you feel bad when you look at your body you there's no way you can't because it's unhealthy so the only way you compensate is by telling yourself you love it telling yourself you love it but when we suppress how we truly feel because the reality is these only fans women if they were made of money and came from lots of money and had lots of money and were truly secure and happy in a great relationship with family and friends and partner, would they be doing it? You don't see anyone doing OnlyFans that comes from generational wealth? Never. 
impossible because there's a legacy. Because because legacy wealth doesn't 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 have access to that kind of content. Another thing you don't see, and I think this is important in social media, is a lot of uh, high value men they teach you know on the fresh and fit is that like she should be half your age. She should be you know like this. Like, people that come from money, men that come from money, do not date women half their age. It, you don't see Mark Zuckerberg doing that. You'll never see Bill Gates doing that. People that come from a legacy and a family, they select people who they can bring to family dinners because it's a legacy. They look at a woman's family. People with new money use women the same way that new money use a gold chain. It's a status symbol. So somebody with new money, of course, will be with a woman half his age and show off with that. Somebody who comes from generational wealth and comes from a family background will know that his dad will say, what are you doing? Bring a proper woman in and then we'll talk. So they know they've got an, uh, they've got an institution to answer to. So so what you're saying then essentially is that men of high value and high worth, yeah, in in this sake, wouldn't wouldn't date the the single the single mum from the broken home, not because the single mum's not good and she's not attractive and all that stuff, but but because it doesn't take the criteria to bring to compromise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, just like a high value woman wouldn't date a guy that's completely broken or anything like that they don't have to compromise they don't have to compromise um that's what truly high value requires it requires your partner not having to compromise now there's nothing wrong with being a single mom or coming from a broken home or anything like that but a true high value man also has a high value kind of background usually so they know that they haven't got time for or they haven't got the effort for dealing with too many overheads so they try and select wisely. Does it, but I actually do think it's wonderful when they do date single mums and do adopt a child I, and stuff. I, I actually think it's wonderful. I have to say, I know some women that are single mums that are fen- not only phenomenal mums to their children, yeah. but also have done the work yeah. as well. And yeah, they may have made mistakes, but those mistakes have turned into like beautiful mistakes. Yeah, you know I what think I'm saying? Even with single dads, I think when you have when you get to a certain age in your life, um and and having somebody else's children is actually a blessing. Yeah, you get to, you realise that it's a blessing. It doesn't always have to be my child only, your child only. What happens when you date somebody who's got children is you get an access into what their priorities are in life. If they have children and they're still out in the club all day, every day, not got their priorities straight, you're thinking they'll never have their priorities straight. Whereas if they have children, you realize that they become highly domesticated. They're in line. They've got their goals and vision. It's like I I get an insight. I get foresight into what you would be like in the future. I already get it. So it's perfect. What do you think the biggest like misguided lie that you see in this in the so in the social setting right now? That, that kind of misguides everyone on how on how life should be, and they think it's working for them, but it's actually not. Uh, in relationship sense, do you think? It, it, in all senses, like the biggest lie on 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 the social media scene in terms of like you know how how people should move. I think the biggest lie is phrases like um, "be independent," "be self sufficient," "you don't need anyone," "you'll be fine," "you got this." That's not how we're designed. You take a brand new baby. If they aren't codependent on anybody, that baby will literally die. Human beings are designed biochemically for connection. They're designed to be codependent. They're designed to love each other. They're designed to be in tribes. Never in history have people not lived in tribes. It takes five, six people to raise a child because that's how much emotional connection they are required to have. Now, we now live in a hyper-independent society that is totally individualistic and teaching everybody, you'll be fine, you got this, self-improvement, self-esteem, self, 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 and nothing to do with a group affiliation. So what happens is when you don't feel great, you feel like you've lost that life. Whereas when we had group settings, it's like, okay, I don't feel great, but my group is doing really well, my, my, my family is doing really well, my tribe is doing really well, I'm good. But now we don't have that resilience because we're totally encouraged to be solo. Do you think, though, that the lack of... Obviously, you come from a religious background. Yeah. Obviously, you're fasting at the moment. Mm-hmm. Do you think that, that your religion has instilled the values? And do you think because we've stepped away yeah. from religion a bit, and, and whether it's being a Christian or Jewish or yeah. whatever religion, do you think because we've stepped away from that, that it's become harder to have that, 
that that grounding in kind of sense of morals yeah absolutely because here's the thing humans are designed to follow some kind of rules we, we need a manual this is how life is we human beings need a manual and i really saw it during covid what happened during covid is people who thought they followed the rules the best actually thought they were the best people in society they thought we're the best like i wear my mask everywhere i sanitize everything i'm the best because what happens is people who we need rules because it tells us that we're a good person when we follow rules and it's you, you know like when you get the work stitches uh, snitches that will snitch on people at work because they think following the rules makes them a good person that's what people think now when you get rule if you don't follow religion you're still going to be following rules whether it's from the government whether it's from social media whether it's from um your friends you're going to fo- fo- uh, follow social norms isn't it better that we follow social norms that were, which I believe were either sent by God or good for our soul? Even if it's not, even if you don't believe it's by, by God, the general rules tend to be love thy neighbor, give to charity, pray, so, uh, disconnect from this world. The rules tend to be good for your soul. So I just think that you're going to follow rules anyway. Why not choose rules that are actually healthy? And uh, I know people think, oh, but there's unhealthy rules in there. But look where society's taken us. We're now going down the route where people think that in order to be a good person, you have to accept people's genders, whatever they want to de- define it as, accept people that might want to... Uh, they, they're now changing the rules to something about, like, children having being able to give consent and, like, almost pushing paedophilia because we, we've followed the norms, do you, do you think that that's something that's, that's actively being driven now that they're trying to um, sexualize society? Because I know that I was before this interview, mm-hmm. I was on I was on Twitter just reading a tweet, and then this Sam Smith thing. I don't know if you saw Sam yeah. Smith the other night. Yeah, I think that's obviously on a personal level. I think it's disgraceful the kind of stuff that's going on with Sam Smith and yeah. the way that he's moving in front of like concerts full of children. children yeah. And I, I'm you, is that something you think that's from a psychological level, when you look at someone like Sam Smith and the way that he's moving right now, what do you see? Do you, do you I see s- depression. Right, okay. I see depression, and that's not just from his sexualized behavior, it's from his body. The first sign of depression is how much you give up on what you put into your body. Wow. Then you start losing respect for yourself. This is what happens when you gain... I say this to my clients that are overweight. I say, I would love to help you, but I promise you, until you start working out, it's limited what I can do for you. Because this is what happens. That's so powerful, I, that is. Yeah, it's limited. Because, And this is why I'm not fat shaming in any way. But this is what happens when we gain weight. Every morsel we're putting into our mouth, we're losing respect for ourselves. When you're in shape and you have a cheat meal, you'd feel like you deserve it. But when you're out of shape and you, do it, you feel guilty afterwards, you're slowly losing respect for yourself. You're, and then when we lose respect for ourselves, our self-esteem drops. And then when our self-esteem drops... We then either we look for extravagant ways to show we're confident. So what will happen is when you've got low self-esteem, you want to be famous. Or when you've got low self-esteem, you might want to do uh, threesomes. You look for extravagant ways to feel good again. Mm. Now, when I saw his, I didn't even pay attention to his costume. His weight was the first thing I noticed. All right, okay, there's a depression. Let's have a look at how the symptoms of the, oh, you're distracting people from the depression by doing all this nonsense. But right. really, you're so, sad. So all the extravagant behavior that people mm. assume in, in, in their reality in society now mm. is all a mask for the, for the, for the depression that they're hiding by, by their body weight, Absolutely. just alone. Yeah, body weight. It doesn't mean if you've got great body, you're in gre- you, your self-esteem is high. I'm not saying that. But the quickest way to assess someone's self-esteem is to look at their body. Because it tells me what you're doing to it on a daily basis. What about these guys that I, when I was, even when I lived in Australia, um, I'd go into gyms like World Gym, mm-hmm. which is like one of these bodybuilding gyms. Mm-hmm. I'd go in there. I'd see these gads, lads that were carved out like Greek Adonises, mm-hmm. you know, that, like Michelangelo's been there with a chisel. Mm-hmm. And I'd look at him. And when I looked into like, into a conversation looked into their eyes, like, I could see a broken man. Broken. Like, in, in, in but there. even those men will be injecting something. They'll be doing something to their body that's not good for it. And here's the thing. Your body is your basically your home. It's, your, it's where we place our psychology. It's a, a home to put your brain. Now, how you treat that home, like if, you have, if you're renting a place, if you treat it like shit, you obviously don't respect the place. And it, same thing, if you treat your body like shit, you don't respect it. So there's something going on in that. So just like if I trashed a hotel room, I don't. If I trash my body either through alcohol, through steroids, through overeating, through having sex with the wrong people, I don't respect it. Something's going on in the psychology. Yeah. 
So what are some of the red flags then that, that both men and women can look out for in the opposite sex that, that, can, that can show them this person isn't whole and, and you know, potentially stop a bad relationship in the first place? I presume if you walk in, and from what you've just said, and you walk in and their place is a mess, it shows you that their headspace is a mess, right? Yeah. And I presume that if their body's in a mess, that it pre- that then pre- presumptively your mind's in a mess too. Mm-hmm. What other things should people look out for? I think what is their decision making in general, and this involves everything. How, what kind of decisions they make with their money, with their time, with who they have sex with, with, um, with how, uh, everything they do, you look at their decision making. Now, if their decision making is responsible, it's sensible, it wants the best for them, and it helps them achieve their potential, super high self-esteem. But if their decision making is so chaotic or it doesn't make it doesn't add up like one minute they're so good at business but then they choose the most toxic partner in the world or they're so good in their relationship but then they gamble on the side it's like there's something there's something in your decision making that tells me about your traumas so let's lean into that and have a look at your own decision making in your life and think okay I'm so disciplined when it comes to food I'm so good when it comes to money but when it comes to relationships I just seem to make the worst decisions why is that or it might be the opposite it's like I'm so good at relationships I'm so good at all of these things but when it comes to business I don't know I make stupid decisions well your decisions tell me where your traumas are when you want to ascertain more in depth on that when you want to get really ingrained in like okay say say i okay now i've accepted that i've got this trauma sorry right right? so i've accepted i've got this trauma i know there's a trauma there how can i use psychology on myself to understand myself more and get and get in there without having to go see anyone or is that not possible Uh, you don't have to go see anyone it doesn't necessarily have to happen you can just you know educate yourself online and stuff but here's the problem what the problem is when people have traumas or when they when their life is a bit of a catastrophe the first thing they do is try and diagnose their partner they will look on google and say signs my ex was a narcissist and i get this all the time i'll get on the phone call with a client uh i just wanted to speak to you because my ex is a sociopathic uh, narcissist pointless session wow pointless session i've literally just had flashbacks i was dating this girl and uh, in the early days of this podcast i was dating this girl and I'd be having this brilliant day and then she'd ring me up and it just felt like she was just trying to start a fucking war with me. Yeah. Starting an argument to cause to cause this drama in my life. And I'm like, where's it just Kate is just like out of nowhere, like yeah. two minutes ago, great, like now there's this big world oh, war starting. She was a bit broken. Yeah, she she had I think there was trauma in relation to her father growing up. So anytime there was separation she would get anxious? Or start a fight? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And very beautiful, very good looking. Um, her mum and dad were still together, but because she was she was traumatized by the by the by her dad had hit her mum. Okay. Right. So there's there's trauma there, mm. and she used to start the most randomest arguments with well, me. What that is is like when people are traumatized, what they do is they fight with their partner to test how much they will fight for them back. So really, when women are fighting like that, they don't actually want to fight. They want to test your level of love and attachment to them. So what may have been happening is you might have been busy in your podcast. You might have been sat at home. Maybe she saw that you liked a picture of a girl. Maybe she saw something that uh, triggered her. She's like, let me start a fight. And I'll start a fight, threaten to leave him. And if he begs me, then I feel good again. I can relax. But if he doesn't beg me, then I know he's a prick. It's a test. I, I knew. I knew. And it was there's a, no I, way I, to win this test, by the way. I, I, As a man, there's I knew, no way I, to win. I, I, at the, at the, I knew it was a test. Yeah. I knew it was a test. I didn't understand the psychological reasoning behind the, the test. The psychological reason would be she's been triggered into thinking that at some point you're going to abandon her. So she wants to abandon you before you can get there first and test your response. On a random Wednesday, that's going on. On a random her. Monday morning. I, I would do it before 7 a.m. sometimes. Do, do you find, do you find the, the cycle of like the moon and stuff like that affects women on a psychological level as well? Um, I, I, I can't comment on things I don't know enough about. 
So unfortunately, I don't know anything about astrology. Because, because I was speaking to my my friend who's a nurse who works in a hospital, and she said that there's some crazy stuff that happens around these four. I'm sure it does. You know, I just uh, I, you, I, religious sh- reasons we don't actually follow astrology too much. So I don't. I've never had my hand read. I don't know too much as I know. I'm a Taurus. I'm very much a Taurus. I know that, uh, but I don't know too much about it. So I can't. No, no I, I respect. I, re- yeah. I, I respect that. I yeah. respect that. So what are some of the key the key learnings that you've learned in the last 12 months that you previously even in your psychological career you hadn't even discovered them one thing I really have found is how many women cheat on men and how many men accept the unacceptable when it comes to women and because and I was explaining this to my friends I have a bunch of really beautiful wonderful friends male female everything and I I think I never realized that we or a certain type of uh, a subcategory. I thought everybody was like us. I thought everybody doesn't tolerate nonsense, and I thought everybody's like that. But I didn't realize that there's levels to it, and there is people out there. There is men out there that accept the unacceptable when it comes to women. And I always knew women do that. I always knew that. Okay, women have a bad boy phase, or women have guys that may leave them unread. I was aware of that because you always hear about it on social media. Women ain't sh- men ain't shit, or men are trash. I always knew that men are naughty, and uh, the type of men I know I know okay I'm sure you're up to nonsense I never knew how bad how bad it is for men when it comes to dating it's impossible for them to find a loyal girl these days but they accept the unacceptable the men I'm around don't accept the unacceptable so I know and I always knew if I did a certain behavior if I did something like this the type of man I want would never accept it but there are men out there that will allow a woman to cheat again and again do uh, be promiscuous go out disrespect him and he'll still beg her for attention I didn't know that existed until I started doing social media stuff so, so where where are you see, seeing this more prevalent? Is it is it more of a younger generation? Yeah, between oh, yeah. what ages? I would say between eighteen to thirty. So, so anyone eighteen to thirty is practically now got no hope of finding a woman. Then, in, in essence, yeah, when you break. Gay. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's not that they have no hope of finding a woman. They have no boundaries. What's happened is they've grown up on porn. This is a. T- I know. I bring everything down to porn, and you can really tell I'm an advocate against pornography. For religious reasons, I can't talk about porn. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what it is? I think if I had one goal in life with this whole social media thing, it would be to remove the obsession with pornography uh, because of what it does to children. Yeah, and uh, you know everything is about children. So what happens is the 18 to 30 year old man. Is grew up on pornography, whereas a guy a bit older, maybe in his thirties, what happened is, of course, he watches porn and watched porn. I'm not naive, but there was an element of like, shit, dad's coming home, can't watch porn right now, or mom's going to find my magazines, or oh my god, how do I get that top shelf magazine? It's so embarrassing. The guy knows my dad, I can't buy it. You know, there was so much like uh, 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 when it comes to watching porn. Whereas now, headphones in bedtime, pornography, children. 11 years old, 12 years old, children. So what happens is their brain is being sculpted into thinking that women are just for sexual purposes and they are hypersexual and this is normal. So when they meet a woman who is engaging in so much promiscuous behavior, either online, offline, in person, whatever, they don't get the same triggers. They don't think, whoa, she's probably not going to be loyal. They think this is how women come. So they accept the unacceptable when it comes to relationships. So much in that that you can unpack, like you know. I'm good, uh, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, that, honestly, like you just you literally you literally broke it down in such a way that it's it's so true, isn't it? When you look at society and how mm. society's moved over the last few few years, even even like you know the the dominance of like the mobile phone and everything like that. Everyone's yeah. everyone's st- stuck to it. Everyone's involved in it. Even on social media now, like we're we're all somewhat in in addicted to dopamine hits mm. so one thing i want to discuss with you today is like there's a i know a lot of um influencers people that are doing doing things and they're trapped into a certain type of con posting a certain type of content yeah. because i believe they're addicted to the likes that that type of content gets yeah. but they actually really they've they've evolved as a person they want to move beyond that content yeah. but they kind of trapped in this cycle if this break it yeah, how do you break that uh here's the thing People attach, it's not your content, it's your authenticity that people actually attach to. 
Because what happens is, of course, my content is not particularly seductive or anything like that. It's nothing like that. But what happened is uh, there's a space for it. There's a space for whoever you are. There's a market for it. People attach to authenticity. That's it. So that's why there's all this cancel culture when they find out that somebody who had this squeaky clean image, they find out something scandalous, they want to cancel them. Why? Because we're like, we've been sold a lie. So here's what it is. People will attach to authenticity. If you just be yourself in whatever regard it is and you put that out for the world, what will happen is it might be less likes, but it's more sincere. I don't have as many followers as the average Insta model. I'll never have as many followers as the average sports model. I'll never have as many followers as her or as many reach or whatever it is. And I'll definitely never have as many brand deals or anything like that. But the people who do follow me treat me like I'm a sister to them. I, I go out in, uh, in Dubai and somebody will come to me and be like, oh my God, your video, da, 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 this and the other. And they treat me like I'm their sister. I literally, they're like, you're like a sister to me. And I've never met this person because they're attaching to the authenticity. So it's better to have fewer but more sincere acceptance. Not many women would go out on the, at the level you are and just openly say that women nowadays cheat a phenomenal amount. Oh, non-stop. Che- do you know what I mean? Like when, and and here's the other thing: they're in denial about it. I will speak to cheating women; they have zero remorse about what they. Because a lot of my clients are women who are cheating on their husbands. They have so such a lack of remorse about it because this is what women do compared to men. Men usually, when they cheat, they start to feel a bit of guilt, so they're nicer to their wife. They're a bit nicer. They might buy her something. They might do be a bit more grateful. Like you know, you're a ride or die. Like poor girl, if she knew what I was doing, let me. Be nice to her. Women, what they want to do to get rid of that dissonance of what they're actually engaging in is they start putting their husband down. They start thinking, my husband's such an idiot. He's so dumb. He's so stupid. So what happens is by putting him down, they feel less guilty about going somewhere else. They justify it in their brain. So the treatment is different. The guilt is greater when a man is cheating on a woman. And would you say it's skewed, skewed more one more to like the female side of cheating these days than the male? Definitely, because they're better at it. Just through the, the fact that women understand psychology at a lot deeper level than men. Because men are more naive. They just think when she says she's coming home late, they don't have that automatic who, what, where. Whereas with women... Do you think? Not as much. Do you think? I, I think I'd think I'd be right onto Do that. You know, I, this, even little things, like even with my social media, and it's open and it's fine, it's not like anything negative. But if my partner had a social media like mine, I wouldn't be happy with it. But he's, he doesn't have a problem with mine, but I would have a, a huge problem with it. And it's just like that element of trust. I, uh, maybe because I'm a bit psycho, but generally I just think... You're a bit. Yeah, a bit. That's, an open, that's an open admission. Very, very, very psycho. Uh, it's always hidden in, hidden, in, hidden in true psycho. That's yeah, that's it. Psycho. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't be happy, even if the message was good. Even if it, I just wouldn't be happy with it because I'm insecure. So you're, sa- you're saying you're insecure? Oh, massively. Did I ever come across like I'm not? If I did, I apologise. I'm very insecure. So would, are the majority of women insecure in some element of their life? Yeah, why wouldn't you be? There's always some element of your life where, you know, you, you aren't necessarily uh, at your peak or isn't exactly how, where you wanted it to go. So uh, being insecure is not a problem. Here's the thing. People see it as like a trigger. And I'm not insecure. I'm fine. Nothing wrong with being insecure. It's about having a handle over your insecurities, knowing them warning people of them and being being kind to yourself because of the insecurity women have a certain i suppose without being mean i suppose they say men age better than women in a lot of respects don't mm-hmm. they? they they say that is, is that is that a truth that in from a psychological point of view that, that women have a, a certain thought process around how they're aging that's why they go and get loads of fillers all this kind of stuff to cover up, to mask. And that's another mask for traumas that they've not dealt with rather than allowing themselves to be beautiful and age nicely. Do you know what I'm saying? Here's the thing. I don't think it's necessarily so much about aging because I do think that children age you, unfortunately, as a woman. So if you have children 22, 23, that can age you more than a 30-year-old who's had no children. So aging is a problem. But here's here's the thing. Men can compensate bad looks. Women can't. When a man is not that good looking, he's super funny, he's super intelligent, he's super successful, he becomes attractive. Especially if he's funny, like that's some, the easiest way to like, you know, get women. Whereas women don't have a compensatory strategy. 
You can be nice, you can be kind, but a guy's not going to think, wow, you're gorgeous. He's just going to think you're a nice, kind, I'll marry you because you're great. But he won't convince himself that you're beautiful, and not really. Whereas for women, when you're the funniest guy, you become super handsome. It's like we right. get this like lens on us. If he's super, or if he's super, you you can become super handsome to a woman in her lens. But for a man, if you're unattractive, you're unattractive. Even if you're nice, pretty, kind, caring, they'll still be with you. I'm not saying they won't choose you, but they're not blinded to your uh, to your looks. They're not going to be like you're the most beautiful girl in the world. They'll still recognize that you're not that attractive. Is so you're saying then essentially that women have only got their their looks to to essentially trade off, really. Well, it's not that they've got this, uh, only got their looks, but if you don't have it, you don't have it. It's that simple. Whereas for men, if you don't have it, you've got charm, you've got banter, you, you got, you got this. So there's thing. something that you can put in Definitely, there that, that will make you sexually attractive. Right, on the, the thing, in the sexual point of view. You can still be yeah. sexually attractive if you're super tall, if you're in shape, you're still sexually attractive. Whereas for a women, if we're not attractive, we're not attractive. But... What's what's to go with? Um, most women say they want a man who's like six. To, if you're not under, if you're not over six foot, you're yep. dead to me. Um, all this kind of stuff that they're saying now on all the dating apps. You know, I'm not on any dating apps now myself, but they do say that on dating apps. Like, mm-hmm. what what is the psychology behind that? What I would say to women is make your criteria in men the pool of women, a pool of men that are attracted to you. Uh, if you're a girl who wants a six foot two in shape man, but none of those men are giving you attention, change your type. If that is the type of man that's constantly coming for you, keep that type. You're very lucky. You can you you've so earned women, those types. So women should change their type predicated on what's attracted to them. Absolutely, it would be a completely pointless strategy being attracted to a man who has no interest in you. No point. If I'm a girl that is. I don't know, let's say, for example, I'm super overweight or I'm super, super short and I'm not getting the type of guys that I that I like. Change your type. They're not going to like you. You either stay single or beg them to like you or use sex to get them to like you or make them need you because you don't, know, because you don't feel like they want you. You're going to set yourself up for psychological failure. So what percentage of women then are going out there into the marketplace misaligned on the type of man that they even want majority i would say majority here's the thing here's how you know you you have a realistic expectation of what you want those type of man that you want always want you back simple same with men men and women here's how you know you've got the right realistic expectations the type of person that you walk into a room and you look at and you think oh he's my type by the end of the night he's speaking to you without you saying a word or girl, a guy, you look at a girl and you're like, that's my type. She's equally interested. She responds to your text. But if you've got this particular type, you know, like, no, I want this type. I don't care. I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle. But they don't come for you. You're deluded. Yes. I, I've never even thought, I, I, and thought I've had you to have this it. conversation with many clients. I've ne- I, I didn't think that you could kind of change your type. I never even thought the concept of changing type. Well, here's the thing. That, that works for men too, right? Yeah, men and women change your type to the people because here's the thing, they like they see it as settling. What if you don't like what if you're a man though who doesn't like the type that he's attracting? That well then here's the thing. You might not like the type that you're attracting, but the type that you want are giving you no time and energy. So do you like that feeling of rejection? Do you enjoy that? Oh. So if you enjoy, like if you change your type to that feeling, not the person. I don't like the feeling of somebody leaving me on red. I don't like the feeling of someone cancelling a date on me. I don't like the feeling of somebody saying no when I ask them out. I like the feeling of someone who responds to me, who cares about me. So choose those people, whatever shape, form, size, colour they come in. So with me, I have a type. What's right? your type? No, no, just What's your type, babes, <laughs> on paper? <laughs> no, no, no. I've, I've, I've obviously got a type yeah. and and that I've been attracted to and I've and I've had relationships with uh-huh. and then I've got this other type that's also good looking and spicy too but I kind of think when you said that when I was, I was saying okay I've got a type and I was going processing it in my mind and then I thought to myself fuck I always war with the, the these women that are my type because exactly. they're, they're, they're all they're but but I still get with them but like they're it's it's drama it's it's drama like it's like it's being being in a fight it will be disrespect here's the the underlying feeling when you go for somebody that is your type but you're not necessarily their type you're there's an element of disrespect 
always there's either i'll cancel on you last minute i will talk to other people there's an element of disrespect if you're causing that person to shift their type to be with you they'll start disrespecting you because they don't want to be there ah, so what happens yeah. yeah so what happens is when you choose the person that chooses you there's an underlying respect choose a person that chooses you then you'll get some self-respect and mutual respect it's fucking it's fucking mental isn't it so so you're saying that there's because if anyone causes I, I, like for example i'll have like maybe i'll have like i'll meet a guy who comes to me and says okay i want a really beautiful girl i want a really really beautiful girl I, she has to be six foot like five foot six tall beautiful blah blah i want a beautiful girl and he's not he's not their type yeah he might be super short he might be overweight he might be a bit older he's not their type and they're convinced that it's just a matter of time that she falls in love with him. But here's the thing, that supermodel girl doesn't have to compromise. So if you are super short, if you're super old, if you're super overweight, she doesn't have to compromise. Why would she choose you? Choose a girl that chooses you because then she's not resenting you for having to compromise. Right, and, you, and, and, and like I say, choose a girl that chooses you, but you're not saying don't choose a non-attractive girl. No, she you, can you, be beautiful. She, yeah, you're saying, you're saying be beautiful, but, but, but actually... she but, chooses you. But, but because, because she chooses you because... She, you are her type. Yeah. You now have peace as a man. You have respect. This is what one thing that men do online. We want peace. We want peace. We want peace. Peace is created. It doesn't just ha- happen. So these guys will be coming home late, liking girls' pictures online all day, talking to other people, and, this, and then be like, why aren't you my peace? Look, selection and behavior. They're not your peace because maybe she is somebody you chose badly or you're indulging in behaviours that aren't conducive to peace. Peace is created. So they come on all these podcasts and they're like, men just want peace, men just want peace, but I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to go sleep around and I'm going to go to the club every night, but I just want to come home to peace. No, babe, it doesn't work like that. You create peace. <laughs> it's just mad how you make it sound so fucking simple like it is it, that simple in, i know in, i think I, you create here's the thing they think it's a magic formula they think that they're going to meet a girl and she's just going to be his piece you, you come correct you create that piece by your behavior well firstly by your selection process you don't choose a woman that's chaotic and got too much you know chaos going on you choose someone who's who also likes peace but secondly, you also create peace in your home by acting in a way that's kind, considerate, respectful, loyal. Peace is an inevitable outcome. But if you want to act, so support, peace is the byproduct essentially to absolutely. all. To, pe- peace is the peace that men want these talk days yeah. and talk about objectively is a byproduct of the selection process that they should have in place. So what you're saying and their behavior afterwards and their behavior with. Once and, got and, that. and the way they the way they conduct themselves with a with that with that type of woman exactly that so essentially then how does a man and a woman get their selection processes down pat are you saying like objectively write it down on a piece of paper exactly yeah. what you want or i'm a really anti like manifest and i'm not really like that here's it i'm very practical Here's how you select peace. You have a list of deal breakers. I cannot tolerate this behavior. So this is what you term as red flags. Red flags. Deal breakers. I cannot, I can't cooperate with this. It might be religious. It might be promiscuous. Or if you've got this kind of behavior, that kind of past, whatever it is, I can't, comp- I can't, you're, you might have a criminal past, whatever it is. I can, loyalty. I, these are my deal breakers. I can't be with you because of this. Now I go through dating with that. With that in my mind, I look at the person, and even if they have fantastic qualities, they're beautiful, funny, successful, but they've even got one deal breaker. Khalas, there's no point. Yeah, there's what was no that word? Khalas, sorry. I'm in, I'm in Dubai. <laughs> well, uh, you know, and I also say inshallah a lot as well. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I might need to yeah, 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 yeah. have a little subtitle. What, 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 what does that word mean? Uh, done. Done, done, finished. Yeah, Finito. so da- if they have even one deal breaker. But here's the problem. People will uh, find somebody that they really like who has a million deal breakers and then try and cling on to that person and get them to change. And the relationship is a roller coaster. Whereas if you just select people who have none of the deal breakers, even if they're slightly less great things, but none of the deal breakers, you are not forcing change. You are forcing acceptance. You're just accepting them. And then the relationship is smooth. This is why when I go into f- generational wealthy environments mm-hmm. and parties and I see how the women conduct themselves and the and the type of women that men have. Yeah. And they might they might not to be honest, even be the fucking best looking picnic no, at the box, but they'll have the beautiful, elegant 
woman that's also come from some generational wealth and it's just the 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 and they might not be eloquent outside of there but in the environment that they're in they are and it's it's very when you look at it from a psychological point of view like okay now i get how synergies there. the synergies there mm. and they, they've they've contextualized and created their environment to mm. represent them because they understand that this woman and this man represents me as a person too yeah. so if you've got a woman going out there and cheating on you and this kind of a and then you're forcing her to behave. You're forcing her to get in line, which Myron really teaches. Like, you just get them to get in line, get them to behave. You can't mould a woman, You can't mould a human being. You can't even mould your children. Think about your children, how much you want them to behave a certain way. And it's like, you can't even do it with them. You can't do it with a person. The best thing is you select wisely. What about the fixers, though? There's a lot of people... I, I, I know mm. before I did... I did I, I went and did a lot of like spiritual healing. I know yeah. you don't believe in that type of stuff, but I did go. I did did go you do and, ayahuasca? No, I've done. Um, I've done a mushroom journey, which healed a lot of generational trauma. Amazing. And um, I know it's probably anti what you believe. No, no, it's not, not that. It's, uh, it's just I also you, find it a bit scary. Right. I'm okay. Not, I'm, a, I'm a wuss. I've never drunk well, alcohol. Uh, well, uh, I've never done anything, I'll, so I'm very. Uh, I've, I, I don't drink alcohol. I've never had alcohol. Um, but I've and I've never had any other drugs other than okay. other than mushrooms. But. I um I went on this mushroom journey and it really wow. it really helped me find peace with because I, because I felt when I was younger that I didn't feel like I had I, my mom and dad had been together like forty five years okay um good family stable home but because I had a sister and I was in my head I was in a competition with my sister I didn't feel loved by my mom right. that lack of love that I f- that didn't feel from my mum at the time that I'd never healed caused all the, my all my dramas in my relationships I you had f- a similar problem yeah yeah you I have lots of sisters. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I you know. felt like, yeah, Absolutely. right? And when you feel like that, unless you heal that, I, I've healed that now, that's why I can talk about it openly. Mm-hmm. You can't talk about something that you haven't healed, right? Yeah. So... But how, how do you measure healing? Well, I just feel... I just... I, I've... I know that, I know you don't like the word, but I just feel peaceful now about talking about it and helping other people by talking about it and saying, look, I had a trauma here mm-hmm. and that, that trigger and that and that deep ingrained belief that wasn't even fucking true. Yeah, it's a core right? belief that you developed. A core, a core belief that I developed that my mum didn't love me, infactual, not true and not present in my reality. However, I took on the took on the belief like it was true and created a narrative around it. And then that 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 by not healing that part of myself, I attracted these these beautiful women that had other ailments in their childhood that they hadn't healed and, and they attracted and by being in that environment it caused chaos. Yeah. And that was and that was well, my well, learning. Here's what core beliefs do to us that's really fascinating. If you grow up thinking that you're not loved by someone, that you believe that that's a core belief. So what happens is that you go through life with that belief and you look for people that validate that belief. And what I mean by that is you look for people that will make you also believe that you're not lovable. This, um, this, this, this is exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. Exactly what happened. So you'll either find someone very caring and push them away until they stop loving you and you're like, your core belief still stands or you'll choose somebody who doesn't love you that much anyway and then your core belief still stands. So we're looking to validate our core beliefs. We're looking for other people to also believe we're not uh, lovable. So until we get rid of that core belief, we'll constantly be in the cycle. Yeah, and and that's what I was doing. I was, I was dating very, 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 very spicy, but very, very, very spicy, toxic. Spicy, right? Very, to- <laughs> yeah. very toxic. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, like it's, I it's, it's just total. It's just <laughs> I just caused myself so much chaos. Well, Trump, well, what you do is strengthen that core belief. And, and yeah, and then what what happens is you back up the belief. You then then once you've reaffirmed that belief to yourself as a man, you go you go out back into the world again. Mm-hmm. And you you have this predeposition on on women and that, and then you attract it to even worse, and you just yeah, you just you and, create a new, new and, until it, until it gets to the point where you're like, hang on a minute, the common denominator here in all this is me. Well, that's how. Well, this is one one of the reasons I asked. Well, how do you measure healing? Um, because people will sometimes come to me and be like, I don't want to talk about my mum issues because I've healed from that. And I said, how are you measuring healing? They're like, because I don't care. But uh, I'm like, that's not healing. Is by your ability to sustain and maintain healthy romantic relationships. Well, he- heal- healing has to also be the part of like, if you can start to talk about it, you can process it, that's right? That's the first step. That's definitely the first step. That's, that's removing the anxiety. But actually knowing if you've healed is... The, ro- Going out, the, yeah. the strength of your romantic relationships yeah, because they can't last with people who are unhealed and how you know you haven't healed and you've just kind of got a handle on it but you haven't fully healed is every romantic relationship still feels a bit like 
It they're forced. It, yeah, and it falls apart. So, so when you've done the work to kind of heal and release the triggers and the tr- and the so-called mo- majority of the trauma, say let's just call it eighty percent, that final twenty percent. Does that come from like going out into the, into the marketplace, so to speak, and just dating until you find it, well, or, first thing or attracting is, it? First thing is when you go into the market space, you select wisely, because here's the thing: somebody who doesn't care about their body will go into the supermarket and select sugars, carbs, yeah. things that are bad for them. Somebody who cares about their body will choose protein, healthy food. Somebody who doesn't care about their psychological health will choose toxic, hard, hard, conditional love, abusive. Somebody who cares about themselves and loves themselves won't be attracted to that. As you ascend as a man um, in in your business and everything you're doing, does it ultimately continue to get harder and harder and harder to find a soulmate because of, because you're ascending in the, in the social circle as well? Well, what happens is the skills uh, that you need for business are not transferable for relationships. So really successful men learn to be hyperlogical, uh, they become cutthroat. They become very limited time. Those skills are not transferable in in relationships. You need to be emotionally connected. You need to be emotionally aware. You need to meet somebody else's needs. You need to be told no. You need to be, you know, you need to compromise. And as a man becomes a CEO and so nobody tells him no. And so, and also he fires people. He's logical. He's this, that. Those skills are not transferable. So it becomes increasingly hard to maintain and sustain a relationship so the only way he deals with it is by selecting a woman that doesn't require as much emotional connection, and right. that's why rich men get cheated on more. Rich men get cheated on more. Now this is a this is a topic. Because here's what happens: like I said to you, to be hyper successful, you have to be very logical, not very emotional, super busy. Therefore, you need a woman who's not requiring that much emotional investment, doesn't mind that you're busy. Those women who don't look for emotional connection look for financial investment. They are not going to be emotionally loyal to you. So would more women cheat on Andrew Tate than they would on a, a lower status guy? I think Andrew is probably one of the few people that's clocked that. And I would imagine he would put women through the ringer before he invests in them. So perhaps not Andrew, but I would say more women would cheat on somebody like, who's a hyper successful man that's out there? I, I want your example. I'm, wait, okay, I'm, I'm waiting say, with bated breath on this. I don't want to upset anyone, but I would say more women would cheat on a CEO of a company than they would of an employer of a company. The employer will probably date another employer who have limited kind of... The employee, you mean? Employee, yeah. yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, another employee. They would date each other. They had have time for work, time for investment. Time for work, time for investing in themselves, the kids, the, all this stuff. So they build something and they create that emotional connection and they're also tapping in and out. And you also know she's not choosing you for lifestyle. She's not choosing you for that. She's not that type of woman. She's choosing you for the connection that you created. Now, the CEO is automatically choosing women who like lifestyle because he doesn't have time to emotionally connect. Right. So which which means... He filters it down. He, his filter is now down to the woman who is okay with you going on uh, business trips all day or every week. He's okay with... As long as the bills but are she's paid. she's also getting banged by the personal trainer. Absolutely. And, and and that's you, you literally that's literally what I you're saying. I believe that in it? this day and age, I, d- I think in our parents' generation it was different. I think in our parents' generation, dad would go to work, mom would stay home. It's fine. Now, what's happened is people feel they are entitled to every source of pleasure that they can access. So, if he's not emotionally available, I should be with somebody who is. So, I'm going to get the best of both worlds, and I'm going to find it somewhere else. Is what Andrew Tate is teaching young men? the full narrative or is there something missing from the context i think (laughs) i'm gonna be careful uh, but i think what he's missing is the difference between new money and legacy money and enjoyment and fulfillment can you can you give me a bit of a deeper explanation on that i like how that sounded so i kind of wanted to leave it at that but i'll add more to (laughs) and i want more more context on that (laughs) here's the thing enjoyment and fulfillment are are not the same thing you can enjoy a girl who's 19 years old and on a boat and take her on a lifestyle, absolutely. Can you have an intellectual, fulfilling, intimate conversation? 
Can you turn to a her? A boat is a red flag to me, by the way. <laughs> it is to me as well. And I hate boats as well. Everybody in Dubai wants a boat, don't they? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so what I would say is you're you're not fulfilling something. You, in order to get... Yeah, you can have that lifestyle, absolutely. But what's fulfilling is knowing that I can speak to this person about any emotional concern I have and she offers me a valid and supportive answer. But if I'm talking to her about my stress and she's like, okay, but what time is the reservations? Uh, but can my friend come on the boat? What fulfillment is in that? You're spending more money on these random girls on a club than you do on your mum, some of these men. They spend more money on a table in, a, in London. Uh, I know guys that will spend two, three thousand pounds on a table, but their mum hasn't got a car. What? Like they, they could what? easily, bu- yeah. Are they you could, serious? Honestly, and their mum is taking the bus, and I'm just thinking, think about that. There's a girl that's come and on your table that will never speak to you again. Is going home with another man, and you're prepared to spend more money on that experience. And but when your mum's birthday is coming up, you're thinking, oh, mum, that's a bit expensive. Is this is this the same? Is this the same psychological framework that is like where you see the guy with the sports car on the council estate driveway? Yeah, is that the same mentality you're talking about? Here's the thing: when we grow up feeling inadequate financially, we need big gestures. Like I was saying, in anything, wherever yeah. you feel inadequate, you need big gestures always. So if you felt like overweight, unattractive when you're young, when you finally get slim, you want to open Instagram and an OnlyFans. When you uh, grew up without money, you want right, a McLaren and yeah. you want a Lamborghini because you need to show people I made it. Now, true fulfillment comes when you don't need external validation. It's hard to do, by the way. That's not something that should just happen. It's very difficult, especially when you've just got in shape. Of course, you want to show it to the world. But true fulfillment comes when you don't require external validation. You, you use that strength to just kind of create your own little circle of people that you love. I love that. And this is... If there's one piece um, of advice that you've wanted to give this year to the whole world, oh, right? That you've wanted to give it to the whole world, but no one's asked you the question for you to be able to give it to the whole world. What, have, what, have, what question haven't I asked you that you want to give the answer to? Oh, what a fantastic question. If I could give one piece of advice to anybody and everybody, um, it would be, I, I would say that the one thing you... Make decisions today that you won't regret in 10 years. Try and do them. Try and live a life where you don't regret your decisions. And people will say there's no such thing as regrets. There's no regrets. But I say there's no such thing as a a good, bad decision. When you make one bad decision, it's followed by a thousand other bad decisions. And when you make one good decision, all good choices come as a natural consequence. So what I would say is have a look at your decision making and don't think, oh, there's no YOLO, forget it. It's okay. Short term, short term, short term. Think about it in the long term because I promise you one bad decision is a hundred bad decisions. Think about them carefully before you indulge in them. If there's one final piece of advice you could give for all the men that are listening to this podcast, right? The, the, if you, if you had to leave the world tomorrow, you're checking out and you've just got to leave men with one piece of golden wisdom that they can implement in their life today that's going to move them forward in their dating life, in their from a psychological point of view, what would it be? It'd be to treat women well. And I'll tell you why. When you treat women well, they become better human beings. When you see that broken woman that's horrible, horrendous, cruel, cheating, there's a man that's her, maybe her father, it might be a partner, somebody's hurt. Her. And what happens when men don't treat women well? We create a society of soulless women. We create a bunch of women who are just egotistical, narcissistic, they are hyper independent, they lose their kindness. But when you take women who are loved by a man, whether it's a father, a brother, a, a partner, when she's loved by a man, she's the kindest, softest, sweetest woman. So in, if you want to create a legacy and an environment where you change this kind of woman, treat them with love and respect. And that doesn't mean all of them. It doesn't mean you take a terrible woman and you start giving her love, but you select a woman wisely and you give her love and a lot of love and respect. And then what will happen is she'll turn into a wonderful, or she should maintain. I, I don't believe you can take a bad woman and give her love and she'll become perfect. I don't believe that happens. They become worse. But if we create a society where men, maybe starting as fathers, really love women, their daughters, they give them so much love and respect and self-esteem, those women become kinder. 
But when you have a father that treats women, be- their daughters neglectfully, that child belongs to the world. And she's uh, narcissistic, horrible, c- unkind, unkind to herself. So treat the women in your world, whether that's your mother, your sister, your child, your wife, treat them well. And if there's one piece of golden advice that you could give to women that's going to help them advance their life, what yeah. would it be? Preserve your body. It's really important for you. Preserve your body in every way you can. Um, it, whether it's on social media, whether it's with the people you interact with, it, whether it's with your friends, family, whatever it is, preserve your body. Treat it like a home for your your brain. And just like you wouldn't trash a hotel room because it's where you're living for the next couple of days, don't trash your body in any way, shape or form. Don't plaster it everywhere. Don't give it out to every man that doesn't deserve it. Don't uh, vandalize it with like tattoos and stuff that you're going to later regret. Treat your body like a home for your brain. I love it. And I really appreciate you coming on Don't this Don't be stage. silly, it's a pleasure. Like, uh, it's, it's honestly been a pleasure to talk about some of these topics, some of them obviously a bit in-depth and not normally what I'd normally touch upon in, right. in this podcast. So it's nice to be able to have the forum with someone who knows in the depths that you know to be able to touch on some of this stuff and really understand the, the deeper meaning behind a lot of the stuff that's gone together. So Thank I really, you for I really asking ap- such insightful questions. No, I, pr- I love when it. I'm on a podcast and I say something that I haven't said before. Because it's hard to How do that. How many things on this podcast have you said? That I think haven't? majority of it. I feel like I've never said before. So I really that. enjoy that because then I'm, I, because I hate watching myself repeat anything. So, you know, um, when I get asked insightful questions, I really, really enjoy it. I, pre- I appreciate you doing it. And guys, do me a solid favor. Yeah? If you've got the amount of value out of this and you've learned some, some lessons in it that I think you should, I know some of these things can be a bit triggering. Um, if you feel triggered at any point during this podcast, there's obviously work there to do. That's the beauty of the work. The work never ends. If you get triggered, it's just revealing a pattern in yourself that you need to fix. That is where your work is. Lean into that. Don't don't hate upon it but i hope this podcast gives you immense value share it with everyone in your network put share it on social media and that is sadia khan thank you so much for having me (laughs) guys do me a solid favor drop a comment below this video and let us know who you want on the podcast next